non-profit organization in Potsdam Gesundheit Cloud, and I'm doing software literally like half of my life already, I think in total, like professionally already like nearly 18 years, which is way too long, and you can see I lost all my hair along the way. So that says something. Um, yeah, so currently a senior software engineer uh, helping out a non-profit organization here in Berlin. Uh, I've been doing various stuff in the past, uh, way too many to enumerate here. The stuff that is relevant for you is like, I've, I'm, I'm an ex-choreo, uh, as we say internally, right? I've been uh, helping to build the Rocket project, a very, very nice alternative to Docker. If, you, if you're into these kinds of things, I really love Rocket, so uh, try it out. And um, also at CoreS, I've been working together with Alex Shomejan on, uh, because I've been also closely related to the Kubernetes project on what we call the Tectonic Installer, which is sort of like a Kubernetes, a commercial Kubernetes distribution. Since the inquiry of Red Hat, I have no freaking idea what will happen to the project. Alex probably also <laughs> doesn't, <laughs> exactly. But the reason we are standing here since we built this project, you know, in, in the last almost like one and a half years now, or is it just one year? A little bit over a year, right? We have some learnings along the way that we like to, to give you along your way when you have the challenge of building your own Kubernetes cluster, right? I mean, we, we made a product, but we actually had the challenge of building Kubernetes clusters on various platforms. So we know the pain, we feel your pain, so uh, and maybe hopefully you will get out of this with a couple of learnings. Before that, I'm, uh, I have also worked with uh, Mesosphere, he's also a, a very good friend of mine. Um, and I've been part, I have been part uh, of, the pro of the team that was trying to replace the Kubernetes scheduler with the Mesos scheduler. So, um, and that's also the reason why, why I'm sort of heavily also involved in the Kubernetes ecosystem. But mostly, you know, I'm a software engineer. You know, I, am, I have no background in infrastructure. I came to infrastructure as a software developer, so to say. And along that way, I learned a humongous amount of things which were super valuable to me in my today's work as a backend, like mostly backend software engineer. I think like this is the canonical idea of what we, every, everybody calls it DevOps. And I think this is exactly it. When a software engineer enters the infrastructure world. So I really like Go, the programming language that is you know, the underpinning of Rocket, as well as of Kubernetes as well as of Terraform, the project that I will show you. Alongside with me, uh, Alex Zomijan. Um, so Alex is an awesome guy. I've, I had the big pleasure um, to work with him over the last year. He's an AWS veteran. He's been working uh, on AWS directly. So if you spin up VMs, you can blame him on AWS. Well, <laughs> well I know, <laughs> I know. If, if you can blame me for spinning up VMs, you're using the wrong server. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so. <laughs> Exactly, so Alex, um, a couple of words about you, like stand up. <laughs> yeah, so, um, thanks Mike, for Mike. the introduction. What? Mike. Oh, Mike, 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 sorry. I'll just like yeah. stay close to you and <laughs> hold it. So yeah, um, like Sergej mentioned, uh, we met roughly a year and a half ago as I joined CoreOS. Um, I initially joined to do monitoring, but they very soon discovered that I have a little bit of background in infrastructure, a couple of years at AWS. So they moved me to the <laughs> installer team. Uh, we've been working together on trying to get people um, to have a nice experience installing Kubernetes, basically. I um, think we did a good job at that. Um, I think so too, yeah. Until CoreOS um, got acquired. <coughs> Before that, I was, as Sergej mentioned, at AWS for a while at OpsWorks, which is the service that's being developed here in Berlin. Um, that's why I mentioned that if you can blame me directly for your instances, that's not the service you want to use. <coughs> um, there are better options out there. <laughs> uh, but what AWS, what, what four years of AWS taught me is how to not do things and how to do things the right way, basically. So it was a huge learning experience just running the service and having all those SLAs like behind your head um, pretty much all the time and trying to do achieve them, um, it's a really enlightening experience. So a lot of that came into the um, tectonic product as we developed the installer. So, cool. so um, you know, working at CoreOS is cr oh, has been crazy at times. Like, you know, a typical um, Monday at CoreOS more or less looks like this. Hey, good morning, Albon and Diago, let's build a container runtime. Or like, hello, Xiang, you know, let's build a Raft-based key value store, which is today backing up Kubernetes. You know, like, working at CoreOS has been really crazy under the 
challenge aspect. So a typical Monday for me and Alex was, you know, Brendan uh, one, one, once a day stepped into our office, literally he came from San Francisco and said, hey Alex and Serge, can you please build a new Kubernetes installer called Tectonic uh, for AWS? It seems like easy, I mean he's been working for AWS. But Brendan then also mentioned, you know, hey, please uh, also make the installer available for Azure, OpenStack, VMware, GCP, and you know, like, Oh, and don't forget bare metal, right? So you can imagine like my, my face in, in this very meeting, like I was literally like, I knew I can spin up VMs on AWS. That was around like that much of knowledge that I had back at the time. Um, so you can, you can think of it of a really nice challenge back then. So yeah, so that was, that was more or less our reaction, reaction back then over a year ago. You know, we were sitting in the core health office and thinking about how to solve this freaking problem. You know, it's not only like probably who of you has to install Kubernetes on more than one platform? Okay, so that's at least two, that's great. Okay, so like, I really, 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 really feel your pain. And I think the, um, the sort of recipes that we can give you along the way will help you out a little bit. Um, so how to solve this? Well, you know, like me and Alex, after having a good sort of um, bottle of wine over the weekend, said, yeah, no problem, well, let's have a look up in the repository of Kelsey. I mean, he, he has all the answers, right? So uh, who of you knows Kubernetes the hard way? Okay, some of you, great. That's a very good, um, that's a very good thing to follow actually because um, Kelsey does a pretty good job at explaining sort of like the lower level intrinsics of Kubernetes when it comes to deployment, you know, like all the parameters of the API server and how you set up things and, and things like that. But you know, like after looking at this a little bit, we were like, meh, right? I mean, it was like a, like a set of written documentation. Oh. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> At least I can say I have the same haircut as him. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Uh, that's great. Um, <laughs> Kelsey has been talking here too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Last March, but exactly. Ago. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so um, I think Kelsey does a great job at you know, explaining the manual steps that you have to perform in order to set up a cluster and I encourage everyone to do so if you're in that business. Uh, nevertheless, it doesn't really solve our problem because you know, we need to automate everything. So uh, we have to take all these recipes that are out there, I mean the experience from, from Kelsey and also our own experiences and somehow make this available in an automated way across many, many platforms using some abstraction that at least allows us to use a common code base essentially, right? So when we looked at the problem, you know, it pretty quickly came clear to us that we must use some abstraction that allows us to abstract away from the concrete proprietary APIs that the cloud providers give you, right? So for instance, on AWS you have CloudFormation, on Azure you have, what, what do, do they have an official name for the API? What? Yeah, manager. resource manager, okay, so Azure has resource manager, whatever. OpenStack is interesting. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so but they essentially all provide um, uh, APIs which are proprietary in, in, in the nature and it's very hard to like find a nice abstraction that covers them all. Terraform helps you a little bit by providing you two big sort of abstractions. One of them is called HCL which is the abbreviation for HashiCorp configuration language, which is a declarative only language. It's like, if you want to say so, it looks a little bit like JSON, feels a little bit like YAML, and it sort of allows you to describe your infrastructure, your target, um, in a declarative manner. And this is what everybody says, you know, like infrastructure as code, more or less. Rather than being imperative in nature, what we know so, sort of like from everyday programming, it's declarative in nature. They understood that a pure declarative language, unfortunately, is not enough to solve all problems at hand. So they invented like a little sort of nested language with the, which they called ICL, Interpolation Configuration Language, which does the imperative parts that HCL cannot provide you, okay? So for instance, like a very, very, very simple thing that, yeah, that you need to do is like branching, if then else, right? If you have just a purely declarative language like JSON, there is no notion of saying things, okay, if I only have one virtual machine, do this. If I have three virtual machines, do that. Mm, and in order to sort of solve this problem, they added this ICL, which is like a mini language 
by the way, really badly designed, but it gets the job done somehow-ish, okay? Um, and these are the sort of the two primitives that Terraform gives you along the way to, um, to construct your infrastructure. And this is the tool that we used. You know, like, if, if Terraform wouldn't be there, I bet that would have been another Monday project that Core has. <laughs> But since it was there and, um, you know, it, it is a pretty ma major project, uh, this is the solution that we went with. So, speaking of building blocks, to build a Kubernetes cluster on your own on any given platform, essentially, like, I could conclude the talk and finish it off here. You essentially just need three things. Like, w who was shocked the first time when you logged in on the AWS console and you, like, saw this huge amount of list of APIs? Like, like I have no clue what they are all doing. Well, like, you all essentially just need three things to get your Kubernetes rolling, okay? So it's compute, storage, network. That's it, end of story, let's have a beer, okay? So more or less, so these are the three major ingredients to, to get running, and honestly, we didn't use anything else, right? As far as I remember, yeah, exactly, yeah. No. network. So, exactly, so, um, yeah, these are the three building blocks that we used from any given cloud provider, and essentially, you don't need more, and the, m like, the smaller the list is up here, the better for you, because one thing you learn across the cloud providers is that they are very drastically with the amount of features, even in those intrinsics that I enumerated here. So for the compute, at least from what we did in the installer also, and I made this slide like very consciously very simple, just to point out how sort of internally very simple that the tectonic installer is, we essentially only maintain three sort of profile of compute machines. One is etcd, which obviously, who, who doesn't know that etcd is sort of the key value store of Kubernetes? You don't know that, okay. So, for your information, etcd is nothing more than a small database. Sort of, not relational, not like MySQL, but like more like Mongo, I would say, right? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a document store, right? So, and like etcd is being used by Kubernetes to store its data. That's essentially it. That, and obviously you have to, you have to somehow instantiate that etcd database, you have to provision it uh, in terms of compute resources, and that's the first thing you have to do. Then you have what we call in Tectonic Installer master machines. They host essentially the Kubernetes control plane. Whatever that means, if you don't know what the Kubernetes control plane is, doesn't really matter, look up in Kelsey's tutorial, it will, it will tell you everything. So the master machines are sort of not targeted at your workload, like your microservices, um, but rather these master machines are only meant for hosting the control plane, the Kubernetes sort of backends itself. And then the third type, well, that's you, that's you, workloads, and that's the workers. And there is no more machine profiles that we sort of envision in, um, in the te tectonic installer. And like, for me at least, there was one visible, like one evident sort of like drawback with the solution. Like, I don't have only one worker profile. I have probably many, right? Depending on your workload. If you do machine learning, you need GPU workers, you need, I don't know, if you have your services, you need more workers that do like IO um, stuff. Um, so the world is obviously a little bit more complex, so you could s classify those worker profiles into more, but I think like to get the big picture running. And honestly, the installer didn't know uh, multiple worker profiles. I don't know we how it's, we, we don't still, right? so we only know one worker machine profile. So it's very simple. Um, the etcd, um, very, very easy. Essentially, there's only one service running on the etcd machines, namely the etcd database itself. Um, as some of you know, etcd is like sort of a little bit of a special database because it, it needs like a very queer, very strange number of machines to operate successfully and that's always like two n minus one machines, which is strange, but it's heavily sort of um, justified by the underlying algorithm that, is, that it is using, which is like a, what we call the raft algorithm um, developed here, which accomplishes <coughs> A majority, a majority quorum of votes in, in a given cluster. So you need like a, like a strange number of, of, it, of those machines, only one, three, five, and, and so on and so forth. So these machines need to, need to know each other, okay? So um, in order to form a etcd cluster, let's say we have to spin up three etcd machines, those three machines need to know their respective sort of IP addresses, they, are, they, are sort of, they need to be able to resolve each other. Etcd gives you three 
possibilities to accomplish that. And I would like to enumerate them and also tell you about uh, the solution that we went with and that currently is still sort of the recommended way to bootstrap at CD machines. The first possibility that at CD gives you, if you look up literally in this documentation link down here, is first of all, um, discovery of other at CD machines via DNS, most notably SRV records. Who has used SRV records before? Okay, cool. So you all know more or less what, what it is doing. SRV records, for those of who don't know what it is doing, is essentially it's a special DNS entry which contains DNS names plus ports. Which is pretty cool because when you have like in a, in a service world, you can enumerate your concrete service endpoints in that, including their target ports. And the only thing you need here is a DNS server, which is pretty cool because DNS servers like, like they are everywhere, right? Um, the second thing that you have at your disposal is what we call the etcd discovery service. <coughs> is, is this still operational, that thing, in production? I don't know. No. Uh, it, it should be. It should be. Exactly, exactly. Okay, <laughs> cool. So it's still valid to be on the list. So again, those at CD machines need to be able to discover themselves. So instead of using DNS, this discovery service literally uses HTTPS. So you have some REST-based endpoint where you, as an at CD machine, post your IP address into, and all the other at CD machines post their IP address into. And then under a certain URL, those set of IP addresses are available. Very simple semantics, um, very easy to understand. Um, and then the third way, well, very easy. If you instantiate your etcd machines and you know the host names in forehand, like etcd-0-1-2.mycorp.org, that's good enough to instrument parameters at etcd to tell them where these guys are sitting next to each other. So, pros and cons, DNS, SRV-based discovery. Obviously, the biggest pro is you have only a dependency on DNS. The biggest con, though, and that's the reason why we did not go with this solution, is because SRV-based discovery, you know, allows you only to bootstrap one cluster per domain, which sort of sucks. Uh, it could be easily uh, fixed in, in the etcd code base, I guess. Um, yeah, or you could just have subdomains for everything. Or you could, you could have subdomains, but... Exactly, but especially like because of this and because of the induced sort of complexity, deployment complexity, we did not go with that solution. Um, the second thing is, is the discovery service. Uh, here you don't have the problem of, you know, bootstrapping DNS first and setting up SRV records and all the, you know, sort of jazz. It sort of like is, sucks from, from, from a provisioning perspective a little bit. But you need a discovery service. And guess what who's hosting the discovery service? It's etcd. So you need etcd in order to bootstrap etcd, and then who bootstraps that etcd that is bootstrapping etcd. So you see there is like a recursive problem, right? So um, CoreOS, today Red Hat, offers this as a service, which is cool, but not so cool if you're in a strictly corporate environment with closed lockdown networks. And honestly, I don't want my internal etcd servers IPs to be, you know, posted somewhere on some service in the United States. You know, I work for a company right now which is now heavily, you know, like Germany focused. Like this is a total no-go, right? If you host this etcd discovery service yourself, you're cool. But then again, you need to bootstrap again an etcd. So that's what you're trying to accomplish here in the first place. So it's sort of like a little bit problematic. So we went with this very simple solution, and I think it's the easiest. You simply assume that those etcd machines have stable DNS host names. That sounds easy, but on some cl pro cloud providers, this is actually a challenge because not all cloud providers provide intrinsic sort of internal uh, stable host names. DigitalOcean is one of them. Yeah. Vulture, I think, is another one of them. So this, is, this may sound like a low-hanging fruit, but if you're on a very restricted cloud environment, that might even like be a small of a um, hindered um, entry level here. But nevertheless, since the Tectonic installer, and I guess you all rather deploy on like bigger cloud providers like AWS, Azure, and so on and so forth, I think um, this is still a, the most sort of recommended way of bootstrapping at CD machines. So how does this look like? If you use Flatcar Linux or CoreOS Container Linux, that's essentially all that you need to declare as a systemd service unit. 
So every flat core Linux, <laughs> as well as each core has container Linux, ships what we call the etcd wrapper or etcd member, we, we some, sometimes call it. And um, essentially what you have to provide here is this whoop, endpoints thingy. And these endpoints encode the uh, DNS names from all the other etcd machines. That's it, boom, done, ready to go. And that's exactly, I copied this today from the Tectonic installer code base. Um, it's open source, by the way. You uh, grab it while Red Hat did not delete yeah, it yet. Um, that's also a good recommendation. And that's literally the, the, the way we solved it. That's, that's the whole system D service, that how we deploy at CD and Tectonic. Uh, questions so far? Great. So let's come to the second profile of machines that we need. The second profile of machines that we need is what we call master machines that host the Kubernetes control plane. And this is like the all, the whole beauty of the Kubernetes, the hard way thing, right? So these master machines host the API server, the scheduler, the controller manager, obviously also the kubelet and the proxy if you're hosting uh, pods on those machines, and additional control plane daemons whenever you need them. On Tectonic, for instance, we go all the way self-hosted, so we also are uh, hosting flannel daemons, in, like network daemons in there, which are responsible for instantiating the, the uh, network overlay uh, necessary for Kubernetes. And, you know, when you use self-hosted, it's better to have some recovery mechanisms when the whole control plane goes down, so there are even additional daemons hosted on, on this master machines, which we call the checkpointers, right? Um, for the master machines, you have essentially two deployment methods or methodologies where the, all the rage out there is, is about. The, f the first one is self-hosted, and I think Cube ADM got support for that recently, a couple of months ago, right? It sounds like, yeah. It sounds like, and there is static deployment. Question, who knows this distinction? Who knows what this actually means? Okay, so it's just very few of you, so I will just shortly explain what self-hosted means. Um, question to you. What can you do with Kubernetes? Hands up, who can answer that question? What can you do with Kubernetes? What, what problem is Kubernetes trying to solve? Container. container orchestration. So it can start containers, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So imagine the API server is a container. So who could theoretically start the API server? Docker, and who tells Docker to start the API server? Kubernetes. Sorry? Exactly, the kubelet and Kubernetes itself. So you could use Kubernetes itself to start itself. Sounds crazy, right? Another sort of, uh, I, I, Alex Polvi had this stupid say, oh, it's not stupid, I'm yeah. sorry, had this nice saying, uh, crazy idea time. And the self-hosted idea was exactly like this, it's like a little bit recursive. Um, we use Kubernetes to start Kubernetes. What we do is we start a super minimal control plane in one process, and then we deploy all these guys here up there as, literally as containers, and then we shut down this temporary mini Kubernetes, and then the actual started Kubernetes takes over administering itself. Most notably, the uh, most known project for this self-hosted stuff is Bootcube. Check it out, it's pretty cool. It's by CoreOS, now Red Hat. Um, Cube ADM also got support for self-hosted. If you're into that semantics, um, that's the way to go. Another question towards you. Why do you think self-hosted could be beneficial? Does anybody know the answer? Hands up. Well, there's no single point of failure once you're up and running. Right, so you have somebody controlling that, exactly. What, what would be another reason? Exactly. Another reason? The most important reason actually for us is tectonic. I'm wondering, who, who did update Kubernetes eventually in the past? Okay, so that's another cool thing that you can do with Kubernetes. You can do rolling upgrades. And you know, your Kubernetes cluster, you cannot assume that you will run with one version like for five years. That's like illusionary, right? So what we, you can do if you go the self-hosted way, you can use the intrinsics of Kubernetes, most notably deployments, daemon sets, and rolling upgrades to upgrade and um, yeah, and like bump the versions of the control plane containers themselves. And it just works. Sorry? Don't ask those questions. <laughs> Psh, 
<laughs> let's, have a, let's have a talk at a beer. <laughs> exactly, sometimes, obviously. I mean, um, I, I totally agree. We also had troubles with that, but I can, <laughs> at least we had a pretty um, good uh, integration test suite around that, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, to answer these questions, if you have more detailed questions, like we can talk about checkpointers, which help you in a disaster case when all the control plane is totally down. But essentially, if you go with the self-hosted way, um, essentially, you have this benefit of upgrading the control plane using intrinsic Kubernetes methods. Um, obviously, you are also um, dependent on the scheduler and you have to trust him that he's doing the right thing, which sometimes can fail, obviously. So if you're like super cautious and are a little bit like, I wouldn't say afraid, I would definitely go with the static way. What the static way does is exactly the same that I showed you with etcd. You simply set up a... Um, systemd service unit and declare the API server to start as a service unit and that's it, All right? So um, to show, yeah? Also, I would add that your workloads should be the most critical thing you need to care about, yeah. your production workloads. If you trust those to be run by Kubernetes, you should be comfortable by, with Kubernetes running itself. That's actually a very good point. <laughs> so if you don't tr trust Kubernetes itself, you rather um, should not use it at all, right? Okay, questions around those two semantics, self-hosted versus static, or is it clear? Okay, if you're interested into projects doing this sort of a thing, you check it out either Bootcube, which is in the incubator of, uh, of the Kubernetes organization. That's one project accomplishing that thing, and that's what we use, that also what Core has developed in the past. And the other big project that sort of catches up slowly is, is kubeadm, with the current limitation, I think, um, to all be able to deploy only one master machine. So that's quite limiting right now. Um, okay, so there was one big limitation. When you go the self-hosted way, a learning from our side, because with the Tectonic installer, we went all self-hosted, okay? Um, the problem is that Bootcube can run only on at most one machine. That's sort of a limitation. If you deploy an HA setup of the Kubernetes control plane, you have three master machines, for instance. Bootcube can only run on one of them. So you cannot like start Bootcube on all three masters and hope that this cluster will eventually um, bootstrap. The problem is um, it can run only on one machine and what we called this machine internally in the Tectonic installer was the bootstrap node, okay? So that's a big limitation. And how do you actually solve the problem of um, accomplishing that? Let's say you have three master machines. Damn it, I wanted to ask the question to the audience because it's a low-hanging fruit. Um, you have three master machines and you only want to run, oh, let me go back, it was just a teaser. And you want to run a boot cube only on one of those machines. Like very naively, what would you do? Hands up. I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay. So what, what, what would you do? <laughs> Hands up, who, are, who knows the solution? S3 load balancing. Sorry? S3 load balancing. You do, uh, S3? Yeah. Okay, well that's another solution, that's cool. Uh, who knows another one? Intuitively? Node exactly. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it. yeah, exactly. So once the master machines are up, there is nothing running yet on them, very easy. Um, your first execute Terraform, what a Terraform calls this, uh, calls this internally is Terraform apply. Then you literally SSH into the machine and start the boot cube system G service unit. And you decide as an administrator or as a DevOps engineer, which of those three master machines is the bootstrap node and call it a day. So that's possibility number one. It's what we call the active sort of self-hosted deployment. Right, because it is done proactively from the sort of machine that you're provisioning from. Or second solution is what we call passive. Let the master machines decide themselves who is going to bootstrap the cluster. And that's very interesting. And that's the S3 solution. And what we accomplished that by doing what we call a poor man's master election algorithm. Okay? And the algorithm is very simple and is as follows get my machine ID, so every cloud provider has some notion of IDs which get assigned to machines and you can usually query them via metadata, via some metadata service. So like, get my ID, transform it into an integer which is sortable, then get all the other machine IDs which have the master sort of label attached to them. So I have all the IDs of all the other master machines. 
and then figure out on the machine that I'm currently on, is my ID the minimum of all available master machine IDs? If so, I am the bootstrap machine, else I skip. Make sense? Okay, so that's the, sorry? In the meantime. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> we actually like, refine the concept. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It turns out that this is all unnecessary. Like the bootstrapping, we were, we were not looking, let's say, far, far enough out of the box at the problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you can, you only need one master machine to start off. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So what we did um, as a mm -hmm. as a follow up to that is you start off with a single master. You do all the bootstrapping on that machine. You don't care about any of the leader mm -hmm. versions. Right. And then you scale out the masters. And because this is Kubernetes, and because all your components are self-hosted and deployed as hmm. daemon sets or deployments, they will be launched on the right. um, upcoming masters as right. well. Right. So that's basically what we're doing in the next generation to install. One objection to this, you need like a two-step process for this. Yes, you do. Right, so that's the, that's the disadvantage of this, of this approach. I still remember our discussion yeah. on this. Uh, the beauty, well, the, not the beauty, but the advantage of this algorithm is that you simply instantaneously like launch three machines and call it a day, whereas here you need two runs of Terraform. Yeah. The first run, which first bootstraps the first master machine, and then a second Terraform run, which bootstraps the other ones. Okay? So let's be very, okay? <laughs> yes? Sorry, how many bootstraps you get for machine IDs? I simply query the metadata service. So usually when you launch virtual machines on AWS, you can attach labels to them and then you can query the metadata service. No, I think step two is describe your scalable GPS. Oh yeah, exactly. That's, that, that's like the implementation detail of it. It's li literally, for AWS, it's like describe the auto-scaling group of the master profile, then you get the set of all machine IDs, right? And then you know your own ma machine ID and you do the algorithm to your own dance, exactly. Make sense? It is specific to the cloud provider, yes. So we deploy this master election yeah. script algorithm to each cloud provider redundantly. Yes, exactly. That's one disadvantage. Because for this, cloud providers don't give you any abstraction. The implementation is cloud provider specific, but the algorithm is generic. You can implement it on Azure and basically yeah. even scale the MFID because it's just running on your SDK. Exactly. Cool. Um, any question to this? Self hosted? Oh, in etc, you also have a new ID. There only you have the problem of how do you propagate the UIDs of the other machines to all the other machines. So that's the only problem you have to overcome there. If you accomplish that problem, then you can do the same dance, obviously. Right. Make sense? Yeah, because the metadata service has all the machines ID. Exactly. Exactly. Answer this question? Yes. Okay. Any more questions? No. Okay, cool. Um, so, workers, not much to say here. The only two things you have to launch on, on, on these uh, profiles is the kubelet and the actual proxy. If you don't know what that means, please look up in the Kubernetes. The hard way, Kelsey does a great job of explaining the semantics of this. And obviously other control plane demons like flannel or whatever is necessary to bootstrap your network overlay. So, silly example on how HCL looks like, okay. And this is actually like for those who don't know Terraform, also a good example on, on the ICL part of it. So you see like this whole sort of machine, and I copied this over from the actual install, Tectonic installer code base. You install a virtual machine called master. Um, you um, encode some custom data into it. And this is an example of the ICL, of the interpolation language, which is imperative because base64 encode is a function implemented in Go, by the way, which you simply invoke, and then the result of the, of the function is being injected into this custom data of the operating system profile. And this is also examples of, of uh, ICL and simply injecting certain variables from the outside. Same thing, oh, this is Vulture, this is my private project because I just picked a stupid, stupidly super cheap random provider where I wanted to host my Play Kubernetes on, but essentially it's all looking the, the very same thing. This is how it looks at uh, on AWS, 
The biggest pro on AWS compared to the other providers is that you have this notion of auto-scaling groups. So you can spin up and spin down automatically master nodes and or workloads depending on your workload and everything just works. Azure has this too, but it had a huge limitation regarding um, storage. I don't know, did they overcome that already or? I think they already fixed it, but we did not. We, did, we didn't catch up, exactly. Cool. So this is essentially how it looks like um, in, in Terraform, so nothing really magic in here. So now, how do you tell, how do you tell AWS that this guy here is a master machine and how do you tell this guy that it has to launch the following system D service units, right? You need some configuration abstraction for that. You need to tell the etcd machines that they have to launch etcd servers, etcd demons. You have to tell the master machines that they have to launch API servers or whatnot, right? So you need to somehow declare the system D service units that you want to launch on CoreOS Container Linux or Flatcal Linux. And CoreOS's answer to that problem is Ignition. And before I delve in, like dive into what Ignition is, I ask the question, who knows Cloud in it or has ever heard of Cloud in it before? Okay. So Ignition is essentially the same thing, but better. Okay. And the reason why, why it is better, at least in, in, in the opinion of CoreOS, is because it runs way earlier than, um, than Cloud in it. Cloud Init has the biggest drawback that it is run after the machine has booted into the root file system, into the target root file system, right? So it's when you, when you launch up Debian with Cloud Init, something, sometimes I do these things to automate stuff, you see you can do like uh, inspect the Cloud Init logs, you know, in var log cloud init dot log or something like this. But for many, many operations, this is way, way too, um, way too late. Imagine you have to format your root, hot, uh, root partition. How do you do that with cloud in it if the system is already booted? The problem, right? So, and how do you, for instance, instrument lower level intrinsics like network cards or something like this before the actual root file system, before the actual network cards are being initialized by system D? So cloud in it is way too late in this whole process. And Ignition rewinds sort of the semantic idea and is being executed actually in an environment which we call initRD. Everybody, who knows initRD? I want to see all hands up here. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay great. So uh, I will ask the experts, uh, Iago, what is initRD? Well, it's an environment that you have before going into the operating system. Exactly. And you can actually run things there, right? You can run programs in initRD, right? Exactly. You can even run like system D in it and actually it runs, and you do, right? So you have like a mini, mini system before your actual target system runs where you can run real programs before the actual root file system is run. And we wrote a small program called Ignition in Go, which is run exactly in that environment, right? And the cool thing is that the initRD is being executed before the root file system is mounted, so you can do all sorts of crazy stuff in there. Um, this is how Ignition looks like. It is JSON, right? And this is the above is an, is an example of how you would declare um, a systemd service unit inside Ignition. And it looks like pretty, you know, ugly because JSON is ugly. Um, so please, please don't write this by hand. Rather use the thing below, which is sort of like a YAML representation of the above. And then you can use what we call the Container Linux Config Transpiler to compile this YAML into JSON. Okay, and then down here you can um, declare your system D service units. But there is more because I told you there is Terraform. So Ignition plus Terraform equals love, okay? Which is pretty cool because Terraform understands Ignition natively. The same way you, you declare your virtual machines, which I just showed you a couple of slides ago, this is the way you can declare Ignition profiles. So inside Terraform, you can declare the system D service. What? Is it okay? Ten break. Oh, 10 minute break soon. Okay, cool. You can, and that's perfect because we will come to my end of, of the first half and then the second half will be taken over by Alex. So you can declare inside Terraform all the system D service units that have to be deployed via Ignition. Okay? And it's all supported natively via uh, Terraform. Um, and that's pretty cool. What, what the above does actually when you execute Terraform apply, it simply generates this ignition JSON that I, that I just showed you before. 
And we use this super heavily inside the Tectonic installer to sort of like declare all the services that we need um, that have to be run on those different kinds of profiles. So if you look at this, we have an ignition um, declaration for masters, for etcd, and worker machines. They are all different. And then they are being provisioned to the actual machines. So the question is, and that's maybe again a riddle question to you. Once I have this JSON generated, how do I transfer this JSON to the actual machine that has to be booted? Riddle. Who knows the or who can sense the answer? What, who? What? User data, exactly. So what is user data? Can you explain to the others? Exactly. So it's it's like a storage thing, right? That you can query via uh, an HTTP endpoint, yes? Exactly, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's something that you can put on your cloud provider, like a huge string, like the ignition JSON string, and then when the machine is booted, sorry? I will, come, I will come to that, I will come to that. Don't worry, the, it, I still have a couple of minutes left. <laughs> so, um, so you can post this JSON, uh, whatever the result of that Terraform apply run is to, to your cloud provider, you can post it like to a REST endpoint, and when the machine boots, it can curl it, again, from this user data endpoint, right? And it's not protected by any means. It's just curl HTTP, some magic IP number, and then you curl the user data down, and then Ignition curls it down, executes the operations that you declared here, and does its thing. Problems. And that's where we, <laughs> where we can end learnings, okay? So Ignition JSON is distributed via cloud user data, which is awesome. But there are concerns. First of all, the biggest concern that we had and still I think are scratching our heads against is security. Because imagine you will also most likely distribute things like private keys for TLS for web servers and stuff like that. Right? So, and you will most likely also distribute like secrets via this user data. And this is honestly what we do. So you must treat user data like a secret. And that's a very important message for you, and that's sort of like, in my opinion, the biggest limitation also on this. We treat user data as a secure sort of environment, so you must do everything to protect your Kubernetes parts, not to break out of that environment and to be able to pull stuff from user data, right? We consider user data a secret, which is, in my humble opinion, the biggest weakness in this model. Second concern is immutability. Once you declared user data, you can never ever change it again. That, well, you can theoretically, on some cloud providers, but on, some, on most cloud providers you can't. And that's also potentially a problem, right? What if your like, sort of ignition profile changes over time? Like, so this, for that you would have to instantiate another machine profile. <clears throat> another big problem is size constraints. I have no freaking idea why AWS has a limit of 16 kilobytes in the year of 2018 on user data. Sorry? Yeah, it should be, yeah, exactly, right? So, come on. <laughs> I, I, I literally have no idea. But, like, I was, fi you don't want to know what tricks we applied, like, to overcome this, this problem, like, including G-zipping and, like, insanity, like, I, I don't want to tell you. Um, so, sometimes you will have to find ways to distribute user data via other means than, um, yeah, user, the user data endpoint. For instance, you mentioned it already, you spoiled it, you can use S3 or other sort of object storage mechanisms that the cloud providers give you. That's one thing. The cool thing about the semantic is that you can change it, it's not immutable, right? You can simply replace an S3 object. And op optionally, you can delete the user data after installation for whatever reason, for security reasons, for instance, and then it is not available anymore. Uh, downside is when you delete it, you cannot boot a new machine, but you know, you will have to solve that problem somehow. If you want to see examples of this, again, like at the end of the session, we will show you pointers to the Tectonic installer. It's still open source, hopefully, it will stay open source, how all of this is accomplished. And this is essentially how we solved the problem on the AWS side of things. We moved out Ignition, totally this big JSON into an S3 object and hosted from there. Um, and that's it, like this is the, the storage, and that the, concludes my last slide because the next thing is networks. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, for the storage part, there is not really much to say. I showed you already some of those hints for distributing your sort of machine profile user data via means of object storage, right? You can use object storage for distributing ignition data and distribution of the deployment <coughs> as it's like systemd service units. And then 
obviously block storage, um, that's sort of like the EBS stuff that you can um, mount into your machines. Here, beware of support inside Kubernetes, cloud provider uh, support, and bugs and vulnerabilities because we some saw some iffy stuff in Azure. Yeah. I need something to drink. I hope you liked the first part. Let's have a break and then Alex will talk about networks. <coughs> Hi guys, um, like Sergej said, I'm Alex. Um, no more introductions. Um, just a huge thanks to Sergej for um, inviting me here to do this talk with him. Um, this was all his idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the maybe the most important, yeah, not necessarily the most important, but one of the biggest differences that you see between different deployments um, on different platforms for Kubernetes is how you handle networking, right? Kubernetes does a great job of um, providing you an abstraction for your workloads in terms of networking. So there is this thing called um, the pod level network so that the, your application actually sees the same um, networking environment no matter where Kubernetes runs on. Um, but that's not necessarily, um, the case when you actually try to deploy Kubernetes, you have to implement the, um, the glue there. So that's what I'm going to try to go over. Um, but first of all, um, let's get a little bit, um, <laughs> some, some, some concepts out of the way. Kubernetes relies heavily on TLS for um, securing the network traffic. And this is important, not necessarily from, I mean, not, not just from the point of view of um, secure traffic, but it has a lot of implications in how you provision your networking and some auxiliaries around that because uh, TLS in its authentication form, so client certificates, um, relies heavily on, I mean, it, you do have to have an identity to present um, that the certificate can be, um, can be validated against, right? Um, now the identity is most of the time based on the FQDN of the machine that is making the call, right? On the host name together with the domain. So that immediately translates into the fact that you need to have DNS in your environment where you are trying to use TLS, right? TLS is like there, there's no, in, there's no hard connection between TLS and, and, and having a working DNS setup, but it really does make little sense to try to use TLS authent authentication, so TLS client certificates without having um, control of your DNS um, environment. Uh, because your alternative if you don't have DNS is to use IP addresses as identities or something else, right? IP addresses are um, not pinned to the machine lifetime. They can change over the machine lifetime depending on how your DHCP, um, DHCP setup um, behaves and so on and so on. So your best bet for providing identity um, in, in a TLS authentication scheme is FQDN, stable FQDN, so you need DNS working. And you, more importantly, you need to have um, control over the DNS control plane. So if you have if you're trying to deploy Kubernetes, but someone else in your organization owns the DNS servers and you don't have good communications or APIs there, that can turn into a very messy setup, right? Because you're gonna be going back and forth with them to provision the, the, the host names and the, and the um, identities for your machines that you need. And if that's not automated, it's like it's the whole installation process becomes a, a mess. Um, Okay, so what kind of TLS um, materials? Hmm? Go on back. Go on back. Okay. What kind of materials? Because <laughs> the first one okay. you need at CD, right? Right. So there's a couple of different. Um, there, there's actually two sides to TLS. There's TLS um, server certificates, which encrypt your traffic. That's their only job, right? and provide an identity to the clients as to whether the machine that they're talking to is the real thing that they're trying to talk to. And then there's TLS client certificates. TLS client certificates act as um, authentication uh, credentials 
for the client towards the server. So they're basically, they're working in opposite directions. You need both in Kubernetes. Um, and the way you, um, th their life cycles are different and the way you provision them may or may not be the same. So in etcd's case, which is illustrated here, um, you need client certificates for the etcd clients talking to the etcd cluster. So that would be your Kubernetes components like um, the API server and sometimes historically, for example, Flannel would talk to etcd directly, but that's no longer the case. Um, but there, whatever is a client to etcd needs to present uh, a uh, TLS client certificate, which is the uh, identity of the client towards the server, right? Um, then you need peer certificates. Peer certificates are used by the various machines that make up the etcd cluster, not the Kubernetes cluster, but just the etcd cluster to um, authenticate and encrypt the client, the traffic between themselves, right? Because the etcd being a distributed system, um, it obviously runs on more than one machine and it needs to trust the other machines that are part of the cluster. So that's how it, how it does it. And then there's etcd server certs, which basically tell your etcd clients that the machine they're talking to is actually part of the etcd cluster they're expecting it to be. Um, you can skip some of them, all of them, but ideally you do the complete setup. And, the certi um, and ideally you have a dedicated certificate authority um, for etcd because um, etcd is it, or should be a different level of criticality than your control plane because this is basically where all of your state stays. So if the control plane machines themselves are compromised, um, you can rebuild them and not lose state. But if these machines are compromised, you cannot easily rebuild them. Um, all right, so um, for the control plane, this, this is the client to Kubernetes, right? Um, you ideally have yet another certificate authority because like I said, they have different life cycles and different lifetimes. Um, and we will talk later about TLS rotation. So that, that kind of makes sense when you think about this certificate has a sp specific uh, lifespan and how do I change to a new one um, in, the, in the sense of a, of a running cluster. So if you have a, an intermediate CA dedicated to a specific, let's say, life cycle domain of, of these certificates, then it becomes easier to rotate them. Um, and also if they're compromised, you can um, invalidate the CA and then all of the compromised certs um, are no longer valid and you can, you can distribute new ones. Um, so who actually uses certificates in the control plane? It's the API server mostly. Um, it does use a couple of uh, certificates which we haven't explicitly listed here. Um, so first of all, it's a server. So it'll, it'll have a TLS certificate for, so a TLS server certificate for uh, providing identity uh, guarantees to its clients. So the clients will um, know that they're talking to the actual API server, not um, a man in the middle thing. Um, then it does have it does make use of the etcd client certificates that I talked about earlier to talk to etcd as a client. So you will have to distribute the etcd clients to the control plane machines, right? Um, and then depending whether you're using aggregated API servers, there's again a different <coughs> set of certificates uh, for the, um, because the aggregated API server are, are standalone processes. Um, Okay, so, um, this is for the internal, what, what we've been talking about until now is for the internal um, kitchen of the, of the control plane. Now, you do have to have access to your cluster from the outside uh, because otherwise it makes little sense to run it, <laughs> right? So somebody needs, to, um, somebody needs to call into your services or your website or what you're, whatever you're running on the cluster, right? Um, and this somebody is your random client from the internet, so you do have to use certificates that are rooted on a public certificate authority as opposed to the other ones where all of the certificate authorities that I mentioned earlier can be private ones issued by yourself or by your 
let's say, um, organization. Um, so for ingress, you do need to have a, nor a, a, a typical um, certificate like you would be using for an HTTP server, um, which is signed by a public uh, certificate authority. HTTPS. HTTPS. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so I've been saying issued a couple of times now, and I mentioned that there's more than one issuing authority involved. Um, for the public one, it's pretty obvious. You use whatever you've been using for your web server ever since. Um, just get public certificates from your favorite um, certificate um, authority. For in-cluster communications, so the etcd certificates and the um, API certificates, you have options. You can still use public certificates, um, but they cost money and it's not mandatory that they're public because nothing public should actually be talking to your etcd cluster. <laughs> so whoever talks to your etcd cluster should be well defined within your organization so you have control about, uh, of what certificate authorities it knows about. Um, so those can be um, uh, self-signed certificates but not self-signed in the sense um, I'm just gonna like make up a CA now on my machine and sign with it. You need to have a process of distributed, uh, distributing internal certificate authorities within your organization for that to make sense and somebody has to own the, the security of those CAs, right? Ideally it's not you and somebody else um, which deals with security. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this makes little sense uh, not yet. We do have a vault operator, but it's not part of the installation process. It's just for client applications. Well, that, could be. that could be, yeah, it could be. Um, because of the self-hosted bootstrapping process, uh, we can't run vault that early because it, it's being managed by an operator. So we would have to like make it part of the bootstrapping process itself. And that was like too much complexity to handle. Um, but that actually is a, a valid option if somebody else runs Vault for you. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, use DNS and um, you make use of the FQDNs as your identities, um, not IPs. Um, Terraform for convenience has um, resource providers that can um, render certificates for you. Um, or you could use your favorite um, certificate generation tool and just import them as files. Um, in the Tectonic installer, uh, which is our reference implementation <laughs> uh, in this talk, we use both. So by default, if you don't supply any certificates, they all get generated during the installation process. You have the option of providing just the CA or um, you can say, I have somebody issuing certificates for me, so here's a bunch of certificates, um, use them. And obviously you have to specify which is which. Um, this is all nice as you install the cluster, but certificates have um, a limited um, validity period, or ideally they should have. <laughs> uh, so when that validity period is over, or um, ideally before it's over, you have to replace them with um, a new one. Now this is basically a, a much more complicated problem than it sounds on the surface because um, you also want to have your, your control plane, your Kubernetes cluster be running and, and maintaining work, like driving your workloads while you do the rotation. So we don't have a recommended solution for that. Um, in the current incarnation of the installer, it's being developed for the next version of it. And, but basically the idea there is um, that instead of distributing them as individual assets, um, what we will do is we will just um, reconfigure the whole instance or replace it with an updated, with an updated configuration of it. Um, which will in turn um, include the, um, the, um, the new certificates. The, the, the side joke here is that you know, we face this problem upon a request from some customer. Yeah. 
And like we did a very silly solution that was like to simply make it the validity from one year to three years. <laughs> and that we are not, yeah. not proud of that at all. Um, there was like the, the stupidest, not the stupidest, <laughs> but like the, the most silly pull request that I ever approved and I was really ashamed of approving the pull request. But it's a really, really hard problem to solve in this sort of setup, right? And I think yeah. this is currently no solution out there, no Tectonic, no Typhoon, no Cube ADM has currently a good solution for the certificate rotation problem yeah. for intrinsic cluster certificates. So. Um, actually, the problem lies more in, in trying to make it generic um, or cr cross-platform or cr cross-environment, so coming up with a universal solution. But what Chris suggested is actually your best bet right now. Um, use Vault or some other um, distribution mechanism. Um, Vault actually is pretty mature in that regard and has quite some nice distribution features. So you can have, uh, let's say, virtual volumes moted, mounted in your file system that carry the, the materials, the secret materials that Vault manages. So you just, let's say, expect the files to be at a certain path within your file system and they will be there because you're running the Vault um, um, distribution mechanism. Or you can have clients call into specific APIs, but that actually means your, your application is tied into the uh, distribution mechanism for legacy applications or if you want to decouple them I think distributing them as files in let's say a mounted volume that something else manages namely vault is um, actually a nice mechanism um, this is I'm, I'm recommending that uh, because I've seen it work really nicely um, internally at Amazon where we had something very similar to um, what Vault does with these volumes where a daemon, a, a dedicated daemon on each machine would take care of mounting a location on the file system and dropping certificates that were allocated to that machine there and that worked well for, for the whole organization. So it's kind of the same idea. It works at Amazon, most likely will work for you too. Uh, but you, knew, you do need to run Vault and manage it and um, for bootstrapping, Vault, Vault needs to be um, available before that. Okay. Cool. So that's that's TLS. Um, but we are actually here to talk about um, network. So these are a bunch of things that you need to reason with when you're choosing um, your networking layout for Kubernetes. So basically, you are most likely going to be running on a PaaS. Um, system like AWS, like Azure, like um, OpenStack, um, or you would be running on bare metal uh, where a bunch of these things go away and other problems come <laughs> to replace them. So let's talk about the past situation first, right? Um, the <clears throat> the past usually provides you with those primitives out of the box. So routing is taking care of, load balancing is taking care of, unless you're on a very uh, simplistic pass. Um, firewall or um, access control is usually taken care of and DNS most likely is also taken care of in the sense that you have APIs to manage them, right? Um, the most important thing to know, to, to uh, be aware of actually when you're running on a cloud provider is the, um, the actual base network of your provider is not a physical network. Like what you're seeing there as a network may actually be an SDN, a software defined network that is managed under the hood by the platform provider. So do not assume that your, that your VMs are uh, directly tied to layer two um, in, in, their, in their host system, right? The host system itself may actually be um, on, a, on a software defined network. Um, that has implications when you uh, layer it with the um, other abstractions that Kubernetes comes with, namely the overlay network for pods and services, and we'll see how. But th this is really important. Um, do take a look at what the, M the recommended MTUs are um, in your cloud provider documentation because if you exceed those, um, funny things start happening because of the fact that that's, a, that's an SDN under the hood. We've, we've been bitten hard by that <laughs> on Azure specifically. 
Uh, so, uh, what kind of networks do you have to reason with um, when you're installing Kubernetes? First, there's the usual machine-to-machine -machine network that um, makes everything possible. Uh, this, like I mentioned, is not always a level two um, at, at your VM level, right? So do not, do not assume that. Um, unfortunately, AWS doesn't document um, explicitly what the implementation for the VPC is, uh, but I can tell you <laughs> from, from seeing it from the other side, it's actually encapsulated in UDP and that's how it transports. Uh, so everything that um, goes into your network interface in, in the VM is, is transported via UDP um, and funny things happen like ARP calls are not actually ARP calls beyond um, the VM level, they're actually HTTP API calls to a control plane. <laughs> so do not assume those kind of things, right? <laughs> because you, you don't know how they're implemented under the hood. I don't know how Azure does it, but um, they may be doing just as crazy stuff, right? Then there's the pod to pod level. This is the um, point where you start controlling things. Um, so pod to pod network, um, is really nicely explained at that, um, at that page on the Kubernetes documentation website. Um, basically, they have a couple of assumptions there that you need to reason with. First of all, each pod needs to be, or Kubernetes guarantees that each pod is addressable by every other pod in the system via, um, via the same IP address. And this, this is the same IP address that the application sees for itself uh, when it looks at, the, at its um, network interface. Um, there is no netting, or Kubernetes guarantees that there is no netting between, um, um, like in the, on the way between um, two pods. So it's a flat, um, it's a flat network there. Um, there is not so much magic involved in implementing pod-to-pod -pod networking. It's actually just a very clever use of routing and IP tables. But there's no encapsulation or um, at least not if you're, uh, if you're not using VXLAN. VXLAN is a different beast. Um, Tectonic actually runs with VXLAN by default for uniformity reasons, because we did not want to support different um, implementations for different cloud providers, but VXLAN is, let's say, the most generic and most sim simplistic abstraction. You can do better than that. So if you're, if you're interested in any kind of performance, um, overlay via VXLAN is not what you want to do. And by the way, I think Typhoon also runs by default on VXLAN but I think the Typhoon, like if you didn't check out Typhoon, it's another nice open source project, which sort of was initiated by a former engineer at CoreOS. Yeah. Maybe he was smelling the silo to Red Hat a lot, man. I have no <laughs> idea. Um, but here, the, the, the Typhoon um, open source page has a nice performance comparison on those different encapsulation yeah. techniques. And then yeah. you can have like really good insights, right? If yeah. you want to go with the low hanging fruit, the XLIN is sort of the easiest because, because it runs over UDP. Yeah. It is very easy to configure, very, very easy to get started, and that's the reason why we choose it as a default, but as Alex mentioned, it's not the most performant one. Yeah, it encapsulates um, as your traffic leaves the, um, the um, Kubernetes node, and then that gets again encapsulated by your cloud provider, so um, yeah, your performance, your mileage may vary. <laughs> uh, then, the third network you have to reason with is a service network. Service network is actually a bunch of um, virtual IP addresses um, that are not actually attached to any interface. They're rather resolved um, through IP tables um, and they're being, um, traffic to these IPs is being forwarded um, to the appropriate pods that they front uh, so that they behave like a load balancer. But they are, implemented just as, as um, targets for um, some IP table rules. They're, they don't actually exist attached to, a, to an interface. Um, these are relevant uh, because if you start looking for them, you won't find them anywhere but in IP tables configuration. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's actually a very clever mechanism for um, 
for a very, um, let's say, lean load balancing scheme within the cluster. Uh, so the minute traffic leaves your pod and is, a, is um, addressed to one of these service IPs, it immediately gets translated to the uh, randomly to one of the um, IP addresses of the service uh, of the pods fronting this um, or backing the service. So you actually talk to the application behind that service um, with just a simple um, IP tables uh, transformation. Just out of curiosity, who of you has heard of service IPs in Kubernetes before? Okay, so that's already quite some people. Okay, cool. Yeah. Who was confused the first time when you heard about service IPs? <laughs> okay, great. It's also Question. worth noting that actually it might not be IP tables. True. The current version uh, of the uh, different airlines is the app. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ingress as in incoming traffic to your cluster, not the ingress controller, um, is actually um, two ways. Uh, it, it, there is traffic to your workload applications and there is traffic to your control plane. Um, they are actually handled by different components. The API can be externally exposed um, if you want to manage um, your cluster, let's say, from a, from a different network than the one it's running in. Um, ideally, this is not exposing directly the master machines, but rather a load balancer in front of them. Um, and then the other kind of traffic is normal app workload traffic, which Kubernetes calls ingress whenever it's being handled by um, the ingress controller, which is like a um, layer 7 um, reverse proxy thing that you can run to distribute um, workload to, to certain services or you can actually access the services directly. So if you're running an API on the cluster, you don't have to run an ingress controller necessarily. You can directly expose the service as in um, number three service um, to your clients. And um, as he mentioned, the IP tables is just um, the IP tables implementation is just one of the options and it's actually just used inside the cluster. Whenever you need to take uh, traffic from the outside, um, you have options. One of it is actually uh, spinning up native load balancers in your, in your cloud provider um, acceptance of a load balancer. So Kubernetes for each service that you deem externally um, accessible or more specifically you um, assign a type of load balancer to it, it'll spin up a, um, an elastic load balancer on AWS or a load balancer on Azure or whatever concept applies in the platform that you run on and which Kubernetes supports. I think right now it's just Azure, AWS and GCP that have implementations um, in Kubernetes. But you, so the important thing to take um, home here is that if you're running APIs or services that are consumed by other um, programmatic clients, you don't necessarily need to use ingress. You can directly expose them uh, and obviously you have to take care of securing them at the application level. Um, okay, so um, at the cluster level, what is your what, is this, what are some typical layouts for the network between your nodes? Um, the most simplistic one, which is usually what happens if you use one of these demo tools like um, Cube AWS, for example, or something that is very simplistic, is you get a bunch of machines spun up that all get public IPs. So essentially, um, your cluster is entirely public um, with all the implications that come with that. I'm not gonna um, like insist too much on it because I think it's obvious for everyone that that's not good. This is just for demos, right? So if it's easy to spin up a couple of public instances or like assign them public IP addresses, you may be able to demo your application running on Kubernetes like that, but I actually wouldn't consider that not even for um, staging in an actual, in an actual environment um, where you develop um, for obvious reasons, right? There's no, um, like all traffic between nodes goes through the public internet. 
Um, you have to really work hard to secure the, each and every node. They may not even be concerned with outside traffic by themselves, but you still need to secure them because they're exposed, right? So don't do that. Um, the other option is um, to have a private network, which sounds, let's say, um, trivial, but depending on the platform that you run on, may not be as obvious um, as it seems. So for example, the VPC in AWS is obviously exactly what they call it, a virtual private network. Um, like I said, don't assume implementation. So this is not um, implemented, let's say, like you would expect in a normal data center scenario, like, for example, like a VLAN. This is, it's not a VLAN. It's just um, a couple of assumptions done at the routing level um, in the in the AWS networking control plane, but all the traffic goes through the same channels, right? There is no physical separation between that traffic and another traffic from another VPC. It's just it's being handled um, through routing rules. So even if it says virtual private uh, cloud, it actually goes through the same channels as, as other traffic, unless you use specific settings, which are like, there are some advanced features in VPC where you can um, sort of isolate yourself from neighboring traffic, but that, that's actually a significant cost on top of your instance. Um, if you're in your own bare metal environment, that's obviously a physical network, uh, which you can uh, reason, it, uh, reason with like you normally do with um, with any kind of uh, physical network. Nodes get assigned private IP addresses. Um, in VPC, that's pretty much all you get. So I don't, I'm not sure how many people have been surprised by the fact that they have a public IP or like an elastic IP and that actually doesn't show up in IP address list. Have you seen that? Have you noticed that? That you actually don't see your public IP address on the instance itself? Uh, can you imagine why? Exactly, it's handled at the border. So it's, it's a NAT feature actually. Um, so in your, in most of private, private network like or virtual private network environments, this applies to Azure as well and I think to Neutron on OpenStack, you don't actually get to assign uh, public IP addresses to those instances. They are handled through uh, border routers that NAT those IP addresses to the specific instance that they're um, assigned to. So bear in mind when you, when you try to uh, deploy your application. For example, this applies when, say you deploy a web server that tries to do like IP based uh, rules and you expect that the IP address that it, it's called with will be available on the machine. That's not the case. Um, the most important thing is that the traffic is actually isolated within the network if you take the appropriate precautions that I mentioned. So in AWS by default it's not, but you can use um, the dedicated networking um, I think they called it, they called it an enhanced networking or something. You have, there's a setting on the instances that you can enable and then basically you get um, separate, um, your, your, network, your virtual network interfaces on the machines get attached to physical network interfaces in the, um, in the DOM zero, in the, in the host uh, machine. And that's a different level of isolation than your normal VPC. Um, like I mentioned earlier, outside traffic only happens through NOT or load balancing. You, you shouldn't expect on any cloud provider to, um, to see like actual IP traffic coming from the outside directly to your instance, even if it has a public IP address. Um, just, just a small question. Who was aware of this, or who is aware if you do deployments like this, of the strict rep se separation of private and public subnets, like in your clusters? So that, that's that's very that, that's very encouraging to to see because like when you see those those tools which like bootstrap your cluster in five minutes your Kubernetes cluster actually have 
make the illusion towards you that like they do all the things correctly. Yeah. But I would like to emphasize what Alex just said. Just be, be very, very careful if you do use like those demo-like tools that they actually don't care. They just care about having a working Kubernetes cluster. They don't care about strict network separation and those security implications that they have. And this is like the important message that we would like to transport. Be very aware in a productive setup that you have to separate those private and public subnets. And even if, you, if the cloud provider gives the illusion of having a separation, yeah. like be aware that this is just a virtual illusion. Okay? Like it's really, uh, there is no real hardware separation except like for this explicit network. Like so exactly. And, and do research the documentation of the network um, implementation in that specific provider because there may be things in there that you did not expect. Uh, so obviously, yeah, most cloud providers have this feature in some shape and form. Um, AWS has the VPC, as I mentioned. There's Azure Virtual Network, which pretty much works in, in the same way. OpenStack does this concept through Neutron. They also have a more simple um, uh, networking stack that I think, what is it called? Uh, the public one? I don't doesn't Nova? come to me. Yeah, Nova, Nova, exactly. Yeah, Nova is basically it's it's not um, isolate. It's non-isolating, so it's a flat um, network environment where um, you don't have the the virtual network concept. Um, everything has IP addresses from the same um, range, and they can all see their traffic. And again, do not assume the implementation below is layer two. Like, do not assume that you have um, the this this um, direct physical layer under the VM. Um, this is an illustration of what, a, let's say, a simplistic um, <laughs> one of those simplistic Just wait tools. For the next slide, okay? <laughs> so those tools that Sergish warned you about, they do this, right? Um, they may spin up a private subnet for. Um, for some machines, they usually put the control plane in what they call a, a public subnet for um, easy accessibility from the outside. They usually assign public IP addresses to the, to the master nodes themselves. Um, you don't have to do that. You shouldn't. The master nodes, at, at the very most, should only allow you to access the API server. You can do that with a load balancer, which is more easily secured. Um, and you have the ability to control which services are, are exposed through a load balancer. So don't assign public IP addresses to masters if you have load balancers at hand. Um, just put them in, in a private network, right? And by the way, this is exactly the network sort of topology that we applied at the Tectonic Installer, and that is also being applied in the open source reference implementation type too. Yeah, yeah, so this is what we started off and then we, we realize that this is actually, we can do better than this. Um, <laughs> this is um, what a friend of ours, um, Johannes Simke, came up with for one of his um, Kubernetes deployments. And this actually better illustrates the fact that if you, if you try harder, you can actually like remove all your Kubernetes components from the public side of the network. So those, those squares up there are the the public subnets, the ones that actually can take um, traffic from the outside. You don't see any Kubernetes um, components being deployed there. So everything is being um, either netted or load balanced into the, into the private side of the network um, on a need to talk to basis, basically. This is the better approach. Recommend Sorry? Yeah, it's reasonably yeah. secure. You can, you can do even better than that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, recommendation from our side, at every, each and every installation you do for production, please draw a network topology diagram. Okay? Yeah. Be very, very aware of the topology that you're in and be able at any second uh, uh, to reason about what you're doing there from a network perspective. It's like one of the biggest sort of like outcomes of, and this should scare you off a little bit, um, for a reason, if you are not aware of the network topology you're running in, you're definitely flying blind when it comes to the Kubernetes setup. So yeah. 
also a very important message to transport here. Yeah. Also, you can make some, some very, let's say, common sense analogies. If you work in a reasonably um, security-concerned organization, you most likely have to VPN into your organization's network to access any kind of internal tools, right? So you won't directly, even if they're authenticated and authorized, you don't have them exposed through the internet. Why would you do that with your Kubernetes control plane, right? Don't put it, don't even put it behind a public load balancer if you have the option to, to VPN and, and access it like that, right? If obviously um, security is of any, let's say, reasonable concern there, <laughs> right? You, there's no need, I mean, it's convenient to expose it and it's, it's authenticated and authorized via TLS, which is a fairly strong authentication mechanism. But still, like, if you don't trust your other network services and your other network tools or your organization's tools to be directly exposed, don't trust um, the Kubernetes API to live on, to, to be exposed to the outside. Um, and just don't do that. Okay, so I mentioned that DNS is actually a um, pretty critical component um, in the whole scheme for, if only just for the um, reason of implementing uh, solid TLS um, schemes, right? So um, the kind of DNS resources that you need usually are an API server endpoint, which actually should be the first one because it's the only thing that is really, really mandatory. Um, because you want to secure it with certificates and certificates need uh, the strong identity of an FQDN, right? Um, also, etcd CD can benefit, like Serge explained, from um, DNS SRV discovery. And not just the SRV record, but you do need to have stable host names if you're using discovery via DNS. So um, you need DNS entries for etcd. You need DNS entries for master nodes if you're gonna access them um, directly in any way, or if you're gonna have TLS between um, your load balancer and the master node. Um, you do need uh, DNS records for worker nodes if, again, you're gonna have TLS between the, the actual service load balancers or the ingress and the nodes itself, but not, neither the master nor the worker actually uh, require you to, to have DNS records for them. It's just if you want to, to have a, a solid uh, security scheme via TLS, you, you want to issue certificates to them, then you need records for them. Or if you wanna, yeah, go ahead. I think we played around with it at some point, but we never actually made it into a feature. Uh, I think mostly because there was not enough um, expertise around DNSSEC. And also you amplify the problem of the certificates, which makes it even harder when it comes to rotation on the DNS level, right? Like somebody love it, uh, some, some people love it, <coughs> it's really ugly. <laughs> Yeah, some, some colleagues of ours uh, did some, some proof of concept things, but uh, they actually never made it into a feature. Uh, right, I moved the slide. So for actually implementing your DNS setup, what you really want, um, if you're using, let's say, the Tectonic installer or any kind of automation tool, is you want a DNS server that is um, API accessible somehow, right? So if, you, if your DNS configuration requires you to open a file, edit it, save it, um, and restart the server, or even worse, pass that file to an admin, that's gonna be kind of um, complicated to integrate in an automation scheme. But luckily, there are options for pretty much any platform um, that can, can be tied directly into your provisioning tool. So what we're doing is we're using Terraform, which has um, resources for um, all these uh, DNS providers. 
and we generate the records dynamically as the resources come and go. So as Terraform creates uh, instances, load balancers, and so on, it also keeps the records in the DNS service in check. Um, AWS has Route 53. There's an API, you access it with your typical AWS client. Azure has Azure Managed DNS, which is part of the Azure Resource Manager API. You can um, manage it uh, through your typical Azure clients. GCP has it. Designate is OpenStack's solution for um, a managed DNS server. All of these are only API based, so the, your only interaction point with them is an API. Um, for bare metal, for example, a good option is actually Power DNS. And in my opinion, this is very underrated. Like this, this tool is very underrated. You can do a really nice, um, really nice things with it, specifically because it has a couple of APIs, not just one. So it has an, a REST API that you can talk to with, with pretty much any HTTP client and manage the records and manage the life cycle of the server and everything. It also has it also has support for RFC 2136, which is DNS update dynamic, which is what dynamic DNS, in, as in as you know it from your home router, uses. Basically, it's um, it's write operations via the DNS protocol. So you can actually publish records um, using the, an extension of the DNS protocol. Power DNS supports that. A bunch of other services, including Active Directory, um, support that. So. Worst case, if there's no API on your DNS server, do check if it supports this mechanism. It's really useful and there are, there is a Terraform provider which makes use of this and you can actually from your Terraform um, <coughs> templates publish records using the DNS protocol to your DNS server. Um, so either way you have options. You, you, it's not hard to deal with DNS as long as you, um, as you have programmatic access to it, right? So this is important when you're planning your cluster deployment. Make sure you, d you check what the state of DNS um, management is in that specific environment where you're trying to deploy it. If this is managed by a different team, a different uh, part of the organization and so on and so on, try to talk to them in advance and see if you can get programmatic access to those servers. Um, because then it becomes a lot simpler and you will also need it during the life cycle of the cluster. This is not just for provisioning. Although subdomain, get them to give you exactly. a subdomain yeah. Them yeah, but on top of the subdomain, you still need to talk to the um, server itself to populate that subdomain sure, with that records. Can be your server then, if you, if you have it. True. Yeah. Be aware that DNS, if it's your server, you have the full responsibility of it. <laughs> So if your right. DNS server goes down, essentially your whole Kubernetes cluster is totally defunct. I didn't want to use more drastic words, but they definitely are fucked. So be aware of the criticality of the DNS server availability. availability. Like the TLDR of these slides is like DNS is the total fundamental sort of underpinning of your cluster setup and also of ours. Yeah. And we had strong discussions also deploying our own DNS server in that regard, like self-hosted DNS. <laughs> And uh, you must not underestimate the criticality of the availability of, of the service, right? It's, yeah. it's the most crucial part of this picture. And we actually did that. We underestimated oh, it. <laughs> and that's, that's the reason why I'm talking to you so much about DNS, which seems yeah. to be like, a, like an already discussed topic, right? Uh, do think about DNS before you start been building the cluster because you're going you're gonna to need it. Uh, there's... If, if you want to work around it or you, you don't have the option of, of controlling DNS for your cluster, you're going to be severely limited in your security options. And, and again, um, Power DNS is a really cool tool, even if it's like 25 years old or whatever. Um, then there is this um, strange idea of split horizon DNS, which I would kind of, I, w I was expecting that um, most people are aware of, but a lot of our um, colleagues were actually surprised when we tried to do this. Um, this is actually um, the only way where you can keep traffic within your cluster 
entirely. So each node, each worker node, is going to want to talk to the API server and vice versa. There's bidirectional um, traffic happening there. So the kubelets call the API server to get workloads for themselves. The API server calls the kubelets for statistics, for getting logs, and a bunch of other things. So there's, there's, there's communication going both ways. And all of this communication relies on, um, on host names because you're using TLS. <laughs> So if, if those host names resolve to public IP addresses, for example, then basically you've, you've, you've uh, blown up all your network containment, right? If you're using public DNS or some third party DNS provider or um, whatever scheme that resolves to public IP addresses, because for example, because your API server needs to be accessible from the outside and you only have one, one set of records for it, right? All the traffic between your nodes and your API server goes through the internet, right? Uh, with all the um, implications that that carries, I'm, I'm just gonna say um, DNS outage and, and um, cloud provider connectivity issues to the internet, which otherwise wouldn't have affected you if you didn't use um, uh, public IP addresses behind those records. So Split Horizon solves that problem by allowing you to have different sets of records for when you're accessing your clusters from the outside versus from when nodes or applications internally need to access um, various other uh, machines in the cluster. This basically means um, that the same record is published twice to the DNS server and depending on where the query comes from, you get one or not, not twice, but you can have multiple um, incarnations of the same record. And depending on where the query comes from, you get either a private IP address that's only accessible within the cluster, which is what you want to do for your node to API server communication, or you get the public one, which is what you want to get when you're, when you're remotely um, accessing your cluster. But do look into Split Horizon DNS most of the tools out there, I think um, Tectonic Installer is the only tool that actually makes use of Split Horizon DNS for, yeah. COPS publishes public IP addresses for your uh, master nodes by default for simplicity and uh, pretty much all other tools do, do this kind of stuff. Um, look into this, it's, it's really useful. Out of curiosity, who ever heard of this concept of Split Horizon DNS before? Okay, so at least that's good. Please spread the word, okay? Just do the evangelization. <laughs> also, in AWS, um, the private side of the, um, of the split horizon setup is handled differently than the public one. So it's resolved within the VPC boundaries. If AWS has a connectivity outage to the outside, your cluster is not affected if you're using um, split horizon, right? Because the resolution for the internal queries happens before traffic goes to the, to, the, to the internet. So it does not have to go through the whole DNS hierarchy to resolve, right? Um, it'll immediately resolve on the first hop um, on, on your um, first resolver, um, which v the VPC provides you. So your cluster would be resilient to AWS independently of your, of your actions or your, your, your setup temporarily loses connectivity to the internet. At least you don't, maybe you, you're, you'll be affected by your workload not being accessible, but at least the cluster won't lose its head because the nodes won't be able to talk to themselves, right? If you're using public IP addresses for your masters, as in you deployed with an out of the box configuration with your random installation tool, your nodes will no longer be ab able to access the API server, which actually lives in the same VPC with them, but because it's publicly resolved, um, that wouldn't work anymore. So you will have a ba basically a, um, an impaired cluster. This is, um, this is an example of how you publish the same record to implement Split Horizon on AWS. So it's a matter of just having two resources two record resources that point to the same um, name. The name is basically what becomes um, your, your DNS record. 
So you can see there's exactly the same name, but in, in one, um, I don't think we're actually. It's the zone ID. It's the zone ID. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they're, they're being published to different zones, right? Um, actually, there's, an, there's another um, attribute which is not illustrated here, which would be the different IP address uh, or like the different um, value of that record that would be published to those specific zones, right? So you would have um, the public zone resolve that, um, that name to public IP address and the private one would have a, a, a different one, a private IP address, right? Um, load balancing, right? This is a solved problem in pretty much all cloud providers with some caveats. Um, I'll explain later. Simple providers like uh, Vulture, for example, or even um, Packet, they don't have load balancing solutions, so you're pretty much on your own there. Um, you do what you normally do in bare metal. You deploy something that acts as a load balancer. Um, or you use Cloudflare. Uh, <laughs> in bare metal, um, most likely you, you are already doing some sort of um, load, load balancing scheme. Hardware load balancers work best. If not, um, you deploy a proxy, a reverse proxy, an HA proxy, whatever, Nginx, but please deploy it redundantly. <laughs> um, I mentioned caveats on the cloud provider side. So for example, in Azure, so all cloud providers allow you to have public uh, facing load balancers and private ones. The private ones act as I've, I kept saying, um, as in like the traffic stays within the bound, boundaries of your VPC. They have private IP addresses assigned if the outside connectivity of the data center is compromised, at least you can use um, whatever that load balancer is fronting from within your cluster. So that's what you want to have for your API server um, facing the workers. You want to have a private load balancer there. The private load balancer, private public scheme applies to load balancers as well as DNS. So if you're implementing split horizon DNS, you have to match that with load balancer facing your private network, different load balancer facing your, your public network for exactly the same reasons. If you lose outside connectivity, your cluster stays functional, right? Uh, now, this works really um, nicely in both in AWS. Um, the only difference when you provide, provision them is actually you set the private flag on the low bands and it suddenly becomes private. Um, in Azure, it's just as easy to provision them, but they don't work like that. <laughs> uh, Azure has a bug where if you, if you make use of a private load balancer, fronting the same set of instances that need to call into it. So in, in Kubernetes, this translates, you put a load balancer in front of the master nodes but your master nodes, they run kubelets as well, which need to talk to the API server, which is being fronted by that load balancer. In this setup, those kubelets won't be able to talk to the API server because the load balancer has a bug and it does not allow traffic coming from the same IP address that is behind the load balancer to loop back into it. So that doesn't work on Azure. It's a, it's a well-known feature. Uh, it's a well-known issue with them. <laughs> Uh, we've actually talked to them about it. They know um, they're trying to fix it. <laughs> they may have already fixed it, um, but I'm not sure. I, I didn't double check. Basically, we were forced to not use that um, in Azure. And we did something uglier, which is basically put the master... No, we, we, did, we still did not go through the public load balancer because that's worse. What we did is we... <coughs> we uh, register the machines themselves directly under a multi-record, um, uh, multi-entry A record, so they... The, yeah, yeah, which, exactly. which is bad. Which is actually not load balancing, it's just a discovery scheme. Yeah. It does not guarantee any kind of load balancing. Um, but it works for now until they fix it. Yeah, um, that's kind of the story with load balancing. 
Most of these actually, most of these hardware load balancer actually have APIs or remote management systems. So um, you could theoretically. Um, Trick. So let's say you, like I use cheap digital provider, like cloud providers to deploy my Kubernetes cluster, like Vulture and DigitalOcean. Like DigitalOcean has a load balance option, but for my sort of Kubernetes experiments where I want to launch a hundred nodes, you know, I don't want to spend another 20 bucks on the load balancer. So Cloudflare has a pretty neat trick um, to balance um, traffic, and that is Cloudflare. Um, uh, pretends to be a DNS provider, right? So you submit DNS A records, or if you're good, like um, IPv6 records to Cloudflare, and then when you do a NS lookup or DIG or dig uh, lookup on your records against Cloudflare, you actually don't get back your IP records. You get back Cloudflare's load balancers. So like if I submit four A records to Cloudflare, and I would query after the submission Cloudflare, and I get back their load balances. And what happens after behind the scenes is that your traffic gets being um, gets being load balanced via Cloudflare load balancers, and they are dirt cheap. They're like five bucks a month or something like that. So that's pretty cool. Um, and this is the neat trick that I use on cloud providers where I don't have like load balancer primitives, right? So Vulture, for instance, doesn't have a load balancer primitive, and I was too lazy to deploy my own load balancer because you know like. I'm a lazy bastard. <laughs> and then I simply, there is a provisioner for Terraform for Cloudflare, and you simply submit your public IPs over there, and they do the load balancing for you. But Make sense? But this is public uh, ingress. This is just for public ingress load balancing. This is not suitable for all the private jazz that um, Alex just explained to you, that's totally not applicable. But if you have like ingress, like your blog, blog page or something, and you want to load balance your um, block um, via public DNS names, and you don't want to spend the money for load balancing, you can use Cloudflare. That's essentially it. I think that's a pretty neat idea, and I think this sort of semantics is a little underestimated, yeah. and nobody implements this semantics except Cloudflare, and I wonder why. I think that's a pretty cool trick, actually. Yeah. Make sense? Does it answer your question? No, you, you submit the TLS certificates against DNS names. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that, that underpins again the importance of DNS, right? So the DNS certificates have um, the DNS names uh, registered, so the IPs underneath don't matter anymore. Subject. Make sense? Cool. That's it. <laughs> So again, thanks to Serge for inviting me and for actually um, coming up with the idea and putting a lot of work into this uh, Just one last question and putting this, this picture aside. Who still thinks Kubernetes is easy to install? <laughs> <laughs> Or does it answer your question more or less? Okay. Um, I'm assuming you've already researched 
um, persistent volumes and persistent volume of claims, right? Exactly. So those are basically being. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So if you want to have native support for exactly this sort of jazz, persistent volumes, persistent volume cl uh, claims, <coughs> then the flex volume stuff is for you, if and only if there is no native cloud provider integration. Right, and even with the cloud provider integration, research them because, uh, for example, <laughs> on AWS, EBS volumes are bound to the availability zones right. in which they were created, so, but pods can migrate the availability zone. So if you have a, a persistent volume attached to a pod and the scheduler suddenly schedules it because you did not constrain it, um, it gets scheduled to a different availability zones, the attachment would fail, the volume attachment would fail. And there's all sorts of subtleties like that. And on bare metal, check out Look, which underlines it creates a set uh, CEFS file system which will create you a stock network. Uh, so on bare metal, that will look very good. You will be able to look at Look as a very nice human being module in the cloud gen. Yeah. Bare metal is yet another story. Like yeah. There you have to come up, actually roll your own solution, which like use some tr intrinsics like with CIFS or ClusterFS or whatnot. Yeah this is becoming even more messier because you have to provide your API for provisioning those volumes, right? And don't over-engineer it. Um, <laughs> a lot of people are trying to come up with very fancy storage systems or distributed storage systems for Kubernetes. If you think about how efficient, how easy it is to deal with EBS in the classical or like VM kind of setup in AWS um, and how well they work, Think about the fact that they're actually implemented with just iSCSI with an a API attached. So, <laughs> and, oh, sorry. and the hardware matters. So, yes. the for any kind of serious um, performance for storage, do use a dedicated network for storage and not the same one as used for regular traffic. If you must run, then go ahead. Yeah. To something else, I would probably need to adjust the ignition. Uh, yeah. Yeah, ign yeah. Exactly. Is that something you would recommend? Uh, no. Something that. <laughs> well. <laughs> one thing you can do to make your life easier in that setup is make sure the the operating system that you go to has uses systemd, because then it's easy to to transfer the ignition configuration into something else that provisions those systemd units. If you don't have systemd or you choose not to use it. You have to rewrite all the logic that we have in system D units. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so cloud unit is the most low in, lowest hanging fruit here if you don't want to go with Core S or flat car Linux. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So pretty much all, all of the in, on instance um, provisioning and deployment of tools happens via system D drop-ins. Um, if you have system D on your target system, just copy whatever ignition renders as drop-ins and yes. distribute them yes. somehow. But beware, if you roll your own distro, uh, you have to be aware of the fact that you need to upgrade the distro and then you need to keep the kernel updated. So container Linux and these sort of things and Red Hat, Atomic, <laughs> uh, you know, provide internal intrinsics which allow you um, sort of autonomous upgrades of those systems in an atomic way, which if you use like classical systems like Debian, is like, if you, did you ever encounter the situation you upgraded a Debian system and it failed in the middle? And then the whole node becomes unusable, right? So there are modern alternatives to those sort of um, problems like Chorus, Continuum Linux, like Atomic, like Red Car, like whatever. Um, which have um, countermeasures against these sort of like disaster failures when you do an upgrade of a node and it fails in the middle. Yeah, but sometimes you are restricted by policy reasons. Or totally, I totally get that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. More questions? So, do you recommend using text files or not? Like, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I can say, say from a totally neutral perspective, as of today, I wouldn't use personally Tectonic anymore um, because of the unclear future yeah. in conjunction with Red Hat. There is actually a very interesting project that those guys are investigating called Typhoon, 
which was in initiated by a former engineer of CoreOS, um, which sort of wanted to have like a Debian-like distribution of Kubernetes using Terraform. So that's something I would recommend uh, right now. And I would definitely recommend going with Terraform because if you look at all, all the other solutions like KubeADM, COPS and whatnot, that is super much opinionated and it's so hard to sort of deviate from it. And Terraform, for me at least personally, gives you like the sort of the only bit of freedom where you can deviate in your own topology and your own requirements set, right? So I would go definitely with a Terraform setup. From an open source perspective, I would probably today go with Typhoon if you go self-hosted because Typhoon is self-hosted all the way through. Um, if you roll your own, it's not super hard if you follow this guy's recommendations and encode them in Terraform. I did this like for two different cloud providers, for Hetzner Cloud and for Vulture. It's not like mega complex, mm -hmm. but you have to be aware of those, like, those trade-offs that we enumerated uh, over those many slides. Does it make sense as an answer? But I want to give the opportunity for a Red Hat engineer to answer that too. So. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you wouldn't be able to use Tectonic anyway because um, it can write as, as a current master or latest, let's say four releases, we don't deploy vanilla Kubernetes anymore. So you would, you would be deploying the whole Tectonic stack, which is Kubernetes as you get it from upstream, but also a bunch of other operators and components that are proprietary to Tectonic, which are optional. You still get a functional Kubernetes cluster, but you will see failing pods there because of missing license, for example, right? So it's, it's a commercial product. You would have to have a license for those higher level components. If you don't have it, those things would be crash looping in your, in your cluster. Of course, you can like disable them because it's all open source. You can just like fork it. A few versions ago, we actually had a flag to deploy. Um, I edited it. It was removed. <laughs> to deploy just Kubernetes as, as, as upstream Kubernetes. So you may be able to fork at that point and, and maintain your own copy of Tectonic. Um, like Serge said, um, the fate of Tectonic in Red Hat is not yet decided. We're still discussing it. Um, it it's going to merge with OpenShift, but in what shape and form we don't yet know. So we don't, we certainly know that the operators of Tectonic are going to make it into OpenShift um, and the self-hosted installation approach, but not the actual tool that, I mean, we, we are still discussing how much of the, the installation tool is going to be kept. Um, so if you want to use it, fork it. <laughs> Yeah. I wasn't um, aware of that. Cool. That's I, I'm, uh, just, to, just as a disclaimer, I'm not impartial, but <laughs> I'm a COPS contributor. So ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Anything else? More questions? That concludes the session. Yeah. Cool. cool.